Linux startup process is the multi-stage initialization process performed during booting a Linux installation. It is in many ways similar to the BSD and other Unix-style boot processes, from which it derives. Booting a Linux installation involves multiple stages and software components, including firmware initialization, execution of a bootloader, loading and startup of a Linux kernel image, and execution of various startup scripts and daemons. For each of these stages and components there are different variations and approaches. For example, Grub, Lilo, SysLinux or LoadLin can be used as bootloaders, while the startup scripts can be either traditional in its style, or the system configuration can be performed through more modern alternatives such as systemd or upstart. Overview Early stages of the Linux startup process depend very much on the computer architecture. IBM PC compatible hardware is one architecture Linux is commonly used on. On these systems, the BIOS plays an important role, which might not have exact analogs on other systems. In the following example, IBM PC compatible hardware is assumed, the BIOS performs startup tasks specific to the actual hardware platform. Once the hardware is enumerated and the hardware which is necessary for boot is initialized correctly, the BIOS loads and executes the boot code from the configured boot device. The bootloader often presents the user with a menu of possible boot options and has a default option, which is selected after some time passes. Once the selection is made, the bootloader loads the kernel into memory, supplies it with some parameters and gives it control. The kernel decompresses itself, sets up system functions such as essential hardware and memory paging, and calls start kernel which performs the majority of systems set up. It then starts up, separately, the idle process, scheduler, and the init process, which is executed in user space. The init either consists of scripts that are executed by the shell or configuration files that are executed by the binary components. Init has specific levels or targets, each of which consists of specific set of services. These provide various non-operating system services and structures and form the user environment. A typical server environment starts a web server, database services, and networking. The typical desktop environment begins with a daemon, called the display manager, that starts a graphic environment which consists of a graphical server that provides a basic underlying graphical stack and a login manager that provides the ability to enter credentials and select a session. After the user has entered the correct credentials, the session manager starts a session. A session is a set of programs such as UI elements which, together, can form a complete desktop environment. On shutdown, all in it is called to close down all user space functionality in a controlled manner. The init then terminates and the kernel executes its own shutdown. Bootloader phase The bootloader phase varies by computer architecture. Since the earlier phases are not specific to the operating system, the BIOS based boot process for x86 and x86 64 architectures is considered to start when the master boot record code is executed in real mode and the first stage bootloader is loaded. In UEFI systems, a payload, such as the Linux kernel, can be executed directly. Thus, no bootloader is necessary. Below is a summary of some popular bootloaders. Lilo does not understand or parse file system layout. Instead, a configuration file is created in a live system which maps raw offset information about location of kernel and RAM disks. The configuration file, which includes data such as boot partition and kernel path name for each, as well as customized options if needed, is then written together with bootloader code into MBR boot sector. When this boot sector is read and given control by BIOS, Lilo loads the menu code and draws it then uses stored values together with user input to calculate and load the Linux kernel or chain load any other bootloader. Grub1 includes logic to read common file systems at runtime in order to access its configuration file. This gives Grub1 ability to read its configuration file from the file system rather than have it embedded into the MBR, which allows it to change the configuration at runtime and specify disks and partitions in a human readable format rather than relying on offsets. It also contains a command line interface, which makes it easier to fix or modify Grub if it JS misconfigured or corrupt. 
GRUB2 differs from GRUB1 by having two stages and being capable of automatic detection of various operating systems and automatic configuration. The first stage loader is loaded and executed either by the BIOS from the master boot record or by another boot loader from the partition boot sector. Its job is to discover and access various file systems that the configuration can be read from later. The optional, intermediate stage loader is loaded and executed by the first stage loader in case the second stage loader is not contiguous or if the file system or hardware requires special handling in order to access the second stage loader. The second stage loader is loaded last and displays the GRUB startup menu which allows the user to choose an operating system or examine and edit startup parameters. After menu entry is chosen and optional parameters given, GRUB loads the kernel into memory and passes control to it. GRUB2 is also capable of chain loading of another boot loader. SysLinux iSolinux is a boot loader that specializes in booting full Linux installations from FAT file systems. It is often used for boot or rescue floppy disks, live USBs, and other lightweight boot systems. ISOLinux is generally used by Linux Live CDs and bootable install CDs. Loadlin is a boot loader that can replace a running DOS or Windows 9X kernel with a Linux kernel at runtime. This can be useful in the case of hardware that needs to be switched on via software and for which such configuration programs are proprietary and only available for DOS. This booting method is less necessary nowadays, as Linux has drivers for a multitude of hardware devices, but it has seen some use in mobile devices. Another use case is when the Linux is located on a storage device which is not available to the BIOS for booting. DOS or Windows can load the appropriate drivers to make up for the BIOS limitation and boot Linux from there. Kernel phase, the kernel in Linux handles all operating system processes, such as memory management, task scheduling, I.O., inter-process communication, and overall system control. This is loaded in two stages, in the first stage the kernel is loaded into memory and decompressed and a few fundamental functions such as basic memory management are set up. Control is then switched one final time to the main kernel start process. Once the kernel is fully operational a euro, and as part of his startup, upon being loaded and executing a euro the kernel looks for an init process to run, which sets up a user space and the processes needed for a user environment and ultimate login. The kernel itself is then allowed to go idle, subject to calls from other processes. Equals kernel loading stage equals, the kernel is loaded as typically an image file, compressed into either Z image or BZ image formats with sleep. A routine at the head of it does a minimal amount of hardware setup, decompresses the image fully into high memory, and takes note of any RAM disk if configured. It then executes kernel startup via I386 head and the startup 32 process equals kernel startup stage equals source IBM description of Linux boot process the startup function for the kernel establishes memory management detects the type of CPU and any additional functionality such as floating point capabilities and then switches to non architecture specific Linux kernel functionality via a call to start kernel start kernel executes a wide range of initialization functions it sets up interrupt handling further configures memory, starts the init process, and then starts the idle task via CPU idle. Notably, the kernel startup process also mounts the initial RAM disk that was loaded previously as the temporary root file system during the boot phase. The INITRD allows driver modules to be loaded directly from memory, without reliance upon other devices and the drivers that are needed to access them. This split of some drivers statically compiled into the kernel and other drivers loaded from INITRD allows for a smaller kernel. The root file system is later switched via a call to pivot root which unmounts the temporary root file system and replaces it with the use of the real one, once the latter is accessible. The memory used by the temporary root file system is then reclaimed. Thus, the kernel initializes devices mounts the root file system specified by the bootloader as read-only, and runs in it which is designated as the first process run by the system. A message is printed by the kernel upon mounting the file system, and by init upon starting the init process.
It may also optionally run INITRD to allow setup and device-related matters to be handled before the root file system is mounted. According to Red Hat, the detailed kernel process at this stage is therefore summarized as follows. When the kernel is loaded, it immediately initializes and configures the computer's memory and configures the various hardware attached to the system, including all processors, I.O. subsystems, and storage devices. It then looks for the compressed INITRD image in a predetermined location in memory, decompresses it, mounts it, and loads all necessary drivers. Next, it initializes virtual devices related to the file system, such as LVM or software RAID before unmounting the INITRD disk image and freeing up all the memory the disk image once occupied. The kernel then creates a root device, mounts the root partition read only, and frees any unused memory. At this point, the kernel is loaded into memory and operational. However, since there are no user applications that allow meaningful input to the system, not much can be done with it. An INITRAMF style boot is similar, but not identical to the described INITRD boot. At this point, with interrupts enabled, the scheduler can take control of the overall management of the system, to provide preemptive multitasking, and the init process is left to continue booting the user environment and user space. Early user space. INITRAMFs, also known as early user space has been available since version 2.5.46 of the Linux kernel, with the intent to replace as many functions as possible that previously the kernel would have performed during the startup process. Typical uses of early user space are to detect what device drivers are needed to load the main user space file system and load them from a temporary file system. Init process. Equals is v init equals. Init is the parent of all processes on the system, it is executed by the kernel and is responsible for starting all other processes. It is the parent of all processes whose natural parents have died and it is responsible for reaping those when they die. Processes managed by init are known as jobs and are defined by files in the init directory. Init's job is to get everything running the way it should be once the kernel is fully running. Essentially it establishes and operates the entire user space. This includes checking and mounting file systems, starting up necessary user services, and ultimately switching to a user environment when system startup is completed. It is similar to the Unix and BSD init processes, from which it derived, but in some cases has diverged or became customized. In a standard Linux system, init is executed with a parameter, known as a rune level, that takes a value from 0 to 6, and that determines which subsystems are to be made operational. Each rune level has its own scripts which codify the various processes involved in setting up or leaving the given rune level, and it is these scripts which are referenced as necessary in the boot process. Init scripts are typically held in directories with names such as RC. The top level configuration file for init is at initab. During system boot, it checks whether a default rune level is specified in initab and requests the rune level to enter via the system console if not. It then proceeds to run all the relevant boot scripts for the given rune level, including loading modules, checking the integrity of the root file system and then remounting it for full read-write access, and sets up the network. After it has spawned all of the processes specified, init goes dormant, and waits for one of three events to happen, processes that started to end or die, a power failure signal, or a request via to init to further change the rune level. This applies to sysv style init. Equals systemd equals. The developers of systemd aimed to replace the Linux init system inherited from Unix system v and Berkeley software distribution operating systems. Like init, systemd is a daemon that manages other daemons. All daemons, including systemd, are background processes. Systemd is the first daemon to start and the last daemon to terminate. Lennart Poet Turing and K. Sivers, software engineers that initially developed Systemd, sought to surpass the efficiency of the init daemon in several ways. They want to improve the software framework for expressing dependencies, to allow more processing to be done concurrently or in parallel during system booting, and to reduce the computational overhead of the shell.
system's initialization instructions for each daemon are recorded in a declarative configuration file rather than a shell script. For inter-process communication, systemd makes Unix domain sockets and dbus available to the running daemons. Systemd is also capable of aggressive parallelization. Equals up start equals. The traditional init process was originally only responsible for bringing the computer into a normal running state after power on, or gracefully shutting down services prior to shutdown. As a result, the design is strictly synchronous, blocking future tasks until the current one is completed. Its tasks must also be defined in advance, as they are limited to this prep or cleanup function. This leaves it unable to handle various non startup tasks on a modern desktop computer. Upstart operates asynchronously. It handles starting of the tasks and services during boot and stopping them during shutdown, and also supervises the tasks and services while the system is running. Easy transition and perfect backward compatibility with SysVinit were the explicit design goals. Accordingly, Upstart can run unmodified SysVinit scripts. In this way it differs from most other init replacements, which usually assume and require complete transition to run properly, and do not support a mixed environment of traditional and new startup methods. Upstart allows for extensions to its event model through the use of initctl to input custom, single events, or event bridges to integrate many or more complicated events. By default, Upstart includes bridges for socket, dbus, rdov, file, and DCONF events. Additionally, more bridges bridge are possible. Equals Runit equals. Runit is an init scheme for Unix like operating systems that initializes, supervises, and ends processes throughout the operating system. It is a re implementation of the seminal Diamond Tools process supervision toolkit that runs on the Linux, Mac OS X, BSD, and Solaris operating systems. Runit features parallelization of the startup of system services, which can speed up the boot time of the operating system. Runit is an init daemon, so it is the direct or indirect ancestor of all other processes. It is the first process started during booting, and continues running until the system is shut down. See also SysLinux, Windows startup process. References External links Greg O'Keefe from Power Up to Bash Prompt, IBM Description of Linux Boot Process at the Wayback Machine A Developer Works article by M. Tim Jones, Boot Chart, Boot Process Performance Visualization.